doesn't always work out like we expect. Wait for it. Wait for it. Yeah. Welcome to Wise Up On Air, the only audio live stream where when you start muted, people notice. So good to be here today. I'm glad that uh, everyone gave me a heads up there in the chat. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, we're going to just jump right in talking about what's happening today on Wise Up On Air. Uh, here in Seattle, sun shining, birds are singing, and we're going to have some news, uh, cool things happening here at Audio Kinetic. We got a little community spotlight because there's always something cool happening in the community of wise authors. Uh, and then we're going to have special guests from Frontier Developments talking about dynamic mixing at scale. They're going to give us a sneak peek under the curtain of development for dynamic mixing at scale. It's going to be awesome. Uh, and with that, uh, let's talk about what's new at Audio Kinetic. First thing is, uh, if you're subscribed to the blog, you've already heard all about the cool series on the WISE approach to spatial audio that uh, AK R&D lead developer Xavier Buffoni has been writing. Uh, fantastic deep dive into spatial audio and the different components that we think about as spatial audio here at WISE. Uh, and if you've been tuned into the live streams here, we just wrapped a three-part series of the Wise Up On Air hands-on covering spatial audio integration into the Wise Adventure game with Unity and Wise. Uh, super cool deep dive, some really interesting insights from uh, co-presenters Mads Moretti, Thali Kaklikian. Uh, we had... Uh, Benoit Santaran for, for one of the episodes, and it really is just a cool uh, overview of integrating spatial audio into uh, a Unity project, going hands-on on it. So have you been checking into that series? Is Have people get, been getting some value out of that? Let us know. I think uh, we're having a good time, so hopefully you're getting something out of it. Um, and this blog goes deeper than that because, again, Mads Moretti, uh, he has written a, uh, a Unity-wise overview and presented this Wise Unity cheat sheet as one of the recent blog posts. And so if you're using Wise and Unity together, uh, it's pretty cool. Um, has a bunch of shortcuts, component um, flowchart, uh, just a lot of good, handy resources for you if you're a Unity-wise developer. Uh, folks from the chat, good to see you. Question from M. Fisher Sound uh, on the spatial audio hands-on. Are we going to do an Unreal version? This is the second or third time we've heard about it, uh, and it does seem like something that would be of value for the future. So give us some time to, uh, to sort out when the best time for that is, and... and uh, we hope to bring that to you some someday soon. Uh, as always, games. People are playing them. I know that uh, in this time of uh, you know staying home and keeping safe and keeping other people safe, I'm playing games more than ever. Uh, and there's been a bunch of cool games released uh, using Wise in the past few weeks. I just want to highlight a few here on our Power by Wise page. Uh, the folks that, uh, who ship Wasteland 3, I know Alex Brandon over there has been working hard on that. Um, Dot Node and Tell Me Why, fantastic interactive uh, narrative storytelling kind of game. Uh, definitely worth checking out. Battletoads, who remembers that from the old days? Uh, probably harder than ever. 
Flight simulator? Come on. What better way to spend your time than just flying around the world in a sound environment powered by WISE? Uh, you know, congrats to Brad Meyer and his team over at Sucker Punch, uh, shipping Ghost of Tsushima, uh, that Kurosawa mode that turns the whole world black and white like an old Akira Kurosawa film is just a fantastic addition. Uh, changes some of the audio up as well. And again, Wise running at the backbone of that. Uh, it's definitely worth investigating, folks. And, uh, you know, just more and more Iron Man VR? Come on new f1 game like just tons of cool stuff uh hope you find the time to dig into that so with that i want to talk a little bit about uh community spotlight and and i'm just out there in the world uh with my eyeball on the wise hashtag uh over on twitter picking up cool stuff that people are doing and i want to highlight a few of those here now uh first up we got nick suda he has a great video using the wise meter to track loudness and unity so he's he's using this as a way to get loudness information from unity and measure that as part of his workflow super cool overview you check out nick suda uh, additionally jordan partridge put together a cool video on side chaining in wise he's doing uh, music and ambient side chaining again a super uh straightforward and a uh, simple technique for, you know, managing the different uh, interactive and dynamic pieces. Talking a little bit more about with Frontier Dev here in a minute. Uh, and just a great introduction for folks exploring side chaining and wise. I've also got Julian Rawlinson, a educator in Edinburgh, uh, has this really cool demo that you can grab on Itch.io that is a immersive uh, virtual installation. Uh, it's pretty cool. I cruise through it. It's got a bunch of instrumentation that kind of comes in and out uh, and just a real nice um, experience using WISE. Uh, last thing I'll talk about is a video that we just released uh, through the Audio Kinetic YouTube channel. Uh, called Archiving Video Game Sound. This was a presentation done in Montreal uh, by Fanny Rebillard and David Viennes. Uh, and the two of them dig deep into, you know, the, the why of archiving, archiving game sound and the how of it. And so it's definitely worth your time. This preservation of our history in game audio uh, continues to be something that is worth we're trying to put uh, some understanding around. So thanks uh, thanks for getting that content out to people. And thanks to the community for really bringing these educational components uh, to enrich the, the WISE community and, and try to share knowledge. Uh, this is definitely core to what we're trying to do here at Audio Kinetic and what I have found to be core in the game audio community. Uh, so with that, I'm going to spin the latest One Minute Wise video from Mads Moretti. Uh, this is a series that he's been undertaking that give you a quick bite of wise knowledge in one minute or less. And so with that, I'm going to spin this for you. Let's create a simple wise game plugin. To do so, create a new plugin, add some processing code and map it to a property then build and use it in WISE. But before we do so, start by installing Python with these libraries, Visual Studio with this Windows SDK version, and WISE along with the platforms you need it for. We'll just be making a WISE game plugin for authoring. Okay, let's navigate to the directory of where you want to create the plugin. Then access the command prompt like this, then create a new plugin based on this VP file from your WISE version, Choose Effect and pre-make it, Matt, which creates a video? solution we can use with Visual Studio. Here, in the XML, we've got this dummy property that remains to be used for something. Let's use it to control the gain level. So in the fxcpp file, in execute, let's multiply the samples with the dummy property. And for proper db scaling, 
convert the multiplication like this, add a disable flag in the XML, and change the value restriction. OK, so set it to release, save, and build it. And then add it to a sound in WISE. That's it. And that's it. So if you're interested in that, uh, we're putting together a hands-on for plugin developing in WISE. Uh, we'll be inviting a bunch of the developers from Audio Kinetic to talk more about that. So uh, we'll keep you posted. Get subscribed, get signed up. Uh, through audiokinetic.com for notifications uh, about upcoming live streams. And uh, yeah, let us know if you're cooking something cool in the plugin world. Uh, we'd love to hear more about it. So with that, I would like to transition to Frontier Developments. Welcome to you all. Hey. Hello. Yeah, it worked. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Cambridge. Excellent. Hey. <laughs> so great. Uh, I'm joined here oh, today. Yeah, it worked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that was the uh, that was the latency offset, uh, and and it works. <laughs> I love it. Uh, I guess we call that a delay tap in audio. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, we're just ignoring that. Yeah, that's, I'm glad we've got that uh, that check now. Yeah. Good, exactly. Uh, the other one we're working with is the tremolo, right? Uh, when you do the rapid fire muting. Oh, the transatlantic tremolo. Or you just have it muted and no one can hear you. I mean, it's a. I hear that's a whole mood. <laughs> Nice, thank you, Matt. Thank you. The, the functional uh, test test suites for this live stream. It's good that we're uh, we've gone through all of the all of the tests. <laughs> we've caught a lot of bugs, I think. Yeah, we prepared very well. Excellent, excellent. Well, uh, thank you all for joining me today, and thanks for being here. Uh, looking forward to your discussion about dynamic mixing at scale. I'm just going to run through really quickly and introduce uh, a couple of you and then hand it off. Uh, so we have Matthew Florians uh, at the bottom. Hey, Matt. Good to see you. Hi. <laughs> uh, we've got Will Auger. How are you doing, Will? Hi, everyone. Great. And then we've got Jim Crofty up in the top. Good to see you, Jim Croft. And Hi. so, Jim audio director of Frontier, give us a little background. Tell us a little bit about your team. Well, you know, a lot of people make jokes about us when we're at, at, um, at conventions or whatever. We meet up with people in the, in the industry. Uh, uh, you know, they seem to think that we have the largest uh, the team in the country just for, I don't know, shits and giggles. And uh, um, we do have a big team. But it's a, there's a very good reason for it because we we've kind of we made the decision early on to you know we, we've got these games Elite Dangerous um, Planet Coaster J, uh, Jurassic World Evolution Planet Zoo they they all um, feature um, a lot of detail um, at great scale um, and we could have made the decision to to to, to not service audio we could have gone well you know we're not we're not going to be up for that challenge um but no we we wanted we wanted to 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 really uh do a great job um really attend to detail um but at the same time you know we had to build and i, I this story will unfold as we as we talk but we had to build about we had to build some systems that can manage that 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 kind of scale um you know, and um, we need people to 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 maintain the projects that we're doing because they don't just. In the old days, we used to, you know, put a product in a box and ship it, and that was it. It was gone. Um, you know, it's a double-edged sword. We get to really go to town on the audio now, which is wonderful for us. We we get really um, 
you know, we can really scratch that audio itch, which is fantastic. Yeah, and when um, you're talking about it, scale, it's like I'm already hearing we've got the scale of the team, we've got the scale of the projects, we've got the scale of, you know, the sound. Uh, so let's get a quick yeah, uh, overview of, uh, of what Frontier does. Uh, I got a trailer queued up. You ready for yep. me to spin that? Absolutely. Excellent. Uh, magic box. Awesome. So that's a quick peek into the Planet Coaster universe. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about a little bit uh, what, you know, what's it like there growing that team, uh, you know, the challenges. And this is just one of the games that you have in production. Like, yeah. what's that so process I, been like? Well, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's been step by step, it's been an evolution. Um, I've just kind of found myself in this in this position. Uh, you know, we've, as I said, it's a double-edged sword. If you commit to quality uh, and attention to detail with really big games, and then those games are, you know, part of a games as a service kind of, you know, mechanism, then um, you've got to leave quite large um, teams on those games as you move forward. So. You know, we made a leap with three or four sound designers and then and some coders, and then we had to leave those guys behind. And we took a few people and, and moved on to to Planet Coaster. And then we've done the same with JWE. We've done the same with with Planet Zoo. And so, really, you know, it's just this trail of of audio people that we've had to leave behind to to service those great projects, yeah. which which are still very much alive. You know? Well, when you talk about game as a service, you talk about games like you said, that are still live, they're still in development, they're constantly expanding, they're being refined, and that takes people, right? It takes people, absolutely, yes. And it, and it takes, um, I mean, I, I don't know how deep you want to go on, on, the, on the people side, but, you know, it's quite interesting that it's not just sound designers. I mean, I've got about, uh, I've got about 14 sound designers, but then, you know, there's, there's eight or nine, no, probably 10 now, um, support staff in terms of, of, of Will's code team. Um, but not just coders, we've got build engineers, we've got an audio rigger now, and we've got someone who's training underneath them, um, you know, doing the more, uh, you know, detailed uh, wise side, side work and, and looking at optimizations in wise. And that's just their job, you know. and and. As you as you scale up, then you can start doing stuff like that, and we're we're seeing that we can be very much like a like an art department now, where we have riggers and we have technical artists, you know, and and then we have the the sporting coders as well, and then we have the asset creators. Um, most of the asset creators are implementing as well, but we have you know, as I say, we've just started kind of um, populating the team with 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 riggers as well, which is you know just wonderful because it. You know, it's this this as I say, support team that can um, that really help our sound designers, um, just like the coders do. Uh, you know, make make stuff the best best we can, and and enable us to to you know to put games like Planet Planet Coaster on on console, um, which, which in itself is is a hell of an undertaking. <laughs> and um, you know, and JWE on a Switch, uh, which we are so proud of. And you mean Jurassic World? Yeah, sorry, I call it JWE because it's just we're used to developing uh -huh. and, 
uh, yeah, Jurassic World Evolution. Inside, uh, inside. And we're going to see a little bit more about that game uh, as well as kind of the core technology yeah. uh, across all that's been expanding across yeah. all the titles yeah. that you have in development. Yeah, so it started with started with Elite. We learned some things on Elite, and then we took those things and we and we went on to Planet Coaster, and we had some different challenges. But we knew, you know, we we'd had that kind of first dip into the our toes into the water about you know sort of analysing what's going on in a game and getting the data from the game and making choices in that way. Um, and you know, we've gone on and evolved our our kind of back end machinery, if you like, and Will can talk about that in a bit. Great. um but yeah we've now we're now like 30 people in our team we've got a big team yeah uh and and i yeah. love this this idea of specializations like when you have a team of that size you start to find those opportunities to apply someone uh who's passionate about a area of of audio um yeah and yeah and that's wonderful as well because you don't have to be um, you don't have to be a, a, a jack of all trades anymore. Right. You know, I, when I started out, I was the guy in the broom cupboard who did everything, uh, as well as some extra stuff um, uh, that wasn't anything to do with audio. And and you know, nowadays, uh, you know, you don't have to be brilliant at certain bits, and maybe you don't implement that well, or you know, maybe you've got a you've got a certain leaning towards something, and that's okay. Yeah. You know, and it's wonderful because we can all kind of support that difference within a team. Exactly. Uh, right. While there still exists the one person does everything, uh, you know, again, we're talking about scale. When, yeah. when the game or the project is of a scale that uh, that a, a single person can meet all those needs, awesome. And today it's all about scale. When you reach a point where you have uh, so much going on, as I know that we're going to see, uh whew, yeah you got to have specialists digging in and owning systems we we, ch we chose this extra just because it, it it gives gives a real um kind of window into you're going to see an extract from from planet coaster and it's it's something a player has created um cool it's a completely free, free completely free camera it's a uh uh you know um people can put anything down they like at any time uh uh and you know what we've managed to do is is make something that is is really interactive and contextual and that's the that's the important thing so anyway if we if you want to look at the video now cool. um rolling it great It's fantastic. So, uh, I've been on some of those rides. 
And that's what it sounds like. Uh, really cool. Uh, uh, well, that's the thing. Because the because that's player driven, that all that content is player driven. You know, how do you make that sound good? Yeah, you know, it's, that was a big challenge for us. Because the um, transitions, as the camera's flying around, everything is so smooth. You get this natural fall off, this natural fade, and I know that kind of artistry with audio takes uh, extreme determination. Yeah, I mean it's systemic, so it's it's, it's about creating something that that can handle the corner cases that just kind of works out of the box and whatever you throw at it. And, and that's what we've developed, you know, and that's what we're very proud of. It sounds fantastic. Uh, we're getting some comments in the chat about how good it sounds. Super impressed. Folks are eating it up. So thanks for sharing that. And, and I want to unpack this. Let's, let's dig yeah. in. Okay. Well, I think, you know, let's, let's start, at, um, uh, uh, the, t the technical level we talk about you know we talk about managing scale where we you know we we we're talking about um you know we're talking about the quality of the audio we're talking about the, the mix which which matt's going to talk about in a bit um but firstly we've got to think about you know the amount of data that if you if you made a one-to-one -one, you know um you know, uh, if you assigned a sound to every single object in that space and you gave it the same priority or you just put priority as as uh, distance, um, you know, you, you wouldn't get the results you wanted. So I think it's over to over to Will to really talk about, you know, what kind of systems we had to develop to understand the context of what we are, what the, what the camera's doing at any given time. Excellent. Uh, so digging in deeper on that uh am i will great to see you today and yeah. you're at the audio lead audio programmer on the team yeah that's right yeah so uh yeah so i joined um i joined the team about four years ago now and uh yeah jim kind of laid down this uh this sort of performance uh problem uh first day of the job on my desk laid it down said okay um, but yeah, I think like obviously, you know, performance is, is key when making video games and that's like, you know, for every game that exists, um, you know, frame rate is king, um, you know, on the audio side, of course, audio dropouts are absolutely not acceptable. I think everybody's working to those sort of requirements. Um, but as Jim was saying, it's the, um, it's the unpredictable makeup of the scene in a typical frontier game. And that thread sort of runs through all the games. Um, you know, the, the, the user created content, the number of emitters, the camera movement, these types of things. So kind of how can we get, you know, reliable performance out of that? And I think, you know, without a sort of real focus on performance, um, then, you know, optimization is like, it's a sort of firefighting exercise. You know, this is typically what happens. Like people will kind of, you know, you've sort of made the game, you're sort of coming to the final push, okay, performance isn't great, let's dig in. You know, and, and that's, that type of firefighting, it just doesn't give you, it doesn't give you good results. I think ultimately, you know, in terms of actually aiming for a performance target, it's not great. But I think most importantly, you don't get the sort of, the actual aesthetic quality because you're trying to like hack and slash um, so it kind of gets in. So this type of this type of performance focus at the end of a project, it just kind of it just sort of gets in the way, really. Um, so what we wanted to do, and I guess what we've been sort of, you know, evolving over the years is, let's try and nail this performance from the start, right? That's the idea. Let's have a system that we can sort of have in place, build from there. Um, and you know, once you, I think once you once you've got this type of system, then you can really you know then you can start to focus on other tech yeah you know we've dealt we've dealt with the sort of the, the 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 cpu performance problem you know let's just make the game sound good you know you can get onto these other issues um it's establishing so, those constraints up front so that you know what kind of box you're working in right and that yeah. begets its own kind of creativity uh, but yes, I, I'm with you 100 percent dialing in and making sure you have the tools in place to be able to keep track of your resources. And, and certainly the WISE profiler gives you one peek into that from the, the WISE side. 
uh, and I know that the work that you do bridges that gap between Wise and the game engine. Yes, absolutely. And I mean, building on top of Wise, you know, is such a you know, it, it's such a good place to be on because Wise gives you you know so much um, sort of room for creativity in the authoring tool. So so much kind of autonomous, you know, um, ability for sound designers, uh, you know, and that's fantastic. Um, but as as programmers on the other side of the fence, as it were, it gives us a really good API to actually control the number of emitters, you know, game object emitters in the world. Yeah. And we can basically, we can write a system our side um, that, that kind of allows us to, to sort of deal with the types of performance issue that we've already highlighted in our, in our game. So, um, yeah, I think, you, you, you know, you don't want to... Um, you don't want to try and sort of fight the sound engine. Yeah. Like, so the our voice management system is totally built on top of WISE. And we're dealing at the sort of like the, as I said, the emitter level rather than trying to manage individual voices. So, yeah. So let's unpack that for a second. Game object, emitter, voices. Like, give me a high level of how those things are interrelated from your standpoint, just so that we can kind of paint a picture of their relationship. Yeah. Um, well, sh could you? I'm just wondering if you could bring up one of the um, uh, the game audio overview diagram, Damien. Have you got that you one? You bet. I sure do. Yeah. Great. Thank uh, you. So here it comes, and I'm going to present that here. Okay. How's that? So yes, I have the game audio overview slide yeah. up. So. Cool. So yeah, you can. This is this is just like probably the most basic view of, of what's going on code side. So, you know, we obviously grab data from the game. Could be animations. Could be like game state. You know, whatever it is. We generally translate that into audio triggering. Probably like um, post event, set RTPC, that type of thing. Yep. And then we kind of go into a voice management system, which controls what data then goes through into the sound engine. And that's really the key bit of special source here. And so voice um, management, it's kind of a filter in a way, and it it allows yeah. some events through and prevents other events from from making it uh, across the, the game engine, sound engine barrier. Yeah, that's exactly right. And we, we found that by doing this voice management before we go into WISE, that's actually really helpful because we don't have the the voice management interleave with the sound design inside Wise. Although obviously Wise can do uh, voice management, if you just have this layer before you get there, you can you can kind of cull out potentially, you know, thousands of game objects. Totally. And each one of those game objects, you could be posting ten RTPCs a frame on, for example. Right. So you know, it's it's very much in your interest to. Um, yeah, if you can if you can get culling done at that point, it's a really good thing to do. Totally. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. Thanks for explaining. So, that. Yeah. No worries. I, I've christened it the. Uh, I've just just come up with this, by the way. This is not no joke. It's the audio, audio placenta. <laughs> okay. Good. That's uh, yeah. that's a wild imagination. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I mean, should we? I mean, we could, we could run. We I think we've got a video of the um, like from a development build of Planet Zoo um, that kind of shows the voice management system debug rendering, so you can kind of get a, an idea of like the emitters and what's going on a bit. We could just let that. Great. I think I have a JWE one actually. Does that sound right? I thought it was Planet Zoo, but I may be wrong. No, it's the one that's called ADC, Debug. Ah, beautiful. I'm rolling it now, and <laughs> we shall... Uh, and, and this is one I'm playing... Uh, are you talking over this one? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is just a little sort of flow through the park, Perfect. so we're just getting a general idea here Great. of the emitters... Um, and you know this is this is a this is a zoo that's been created by a player, so we have no idea what how things are laid out. Great, um, videos rolling, you know, and 
And so, yeah, we're flying through the park. Yeah. So this is just, you know, this is just to kind of get you, give you a visualization of the culling going on. So you can see some um, spheres that um, that show the different, uh, some of the different emitters in the scene. You can see some of them are green, some of them are purple or white. And basically the ones that are green are the ones that we're allowing through to the sound engine. And everything that's purple and white, we're saying, no, no, we're going we're gonna to hold on to that. We're going we're gonna to cull that before it even goes through to Wise. Um, and basically, yeah, we, 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 have, we have a sort of um, contextual recipes that decide when something goes green or not. So it's not just, you know, nearest 10. You know, that, that, that type of thing, you know, um, I think gets you so far. But I think when you've got, um, you know, a, a sort of a rich texture of audio, in, in the in the in the get in the scene then you you kind of uh yeah you need a bit more than nearest 10 you know you might want to show um some animals at the other side of the park roaring you might want to have um a like a zookeeper giving you some important information you know basically we need to we, we specify these quite sort of um you know custom recipes that fit the different contexts in the game that, that basically allow us to cull, you know, it's really, really, we, we took the, um, we took inspiration here from, from linear sound design. Of course. So like, you know, if you were, if you were doing linear scoring of this, you know, you wouldn't necessarily, you certainly wouldn't just have the nearest 10 things, you know, you'd want to hear, you know, you know, the key bits in the scene that actually, uh, you know, are sort of, uh, the player wants to know about. Yeah, and this is actually the, these recipes you're talking about are that first step towards dynamic mixing. Right, they're they're created by the designers. They're meant to evoke a certain sound scene uh, that's appropriate, and it's dynamic. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, and it's like, and some of the recipes. It turns out some of the recipes are super generic. Like sometimes you do just want to hear the nearest ten, or you you just want to hear what's visible right to the camera, but sometimes you want to hear. You you want to always hear a lion in the in the park, or you or you want to hear the roller coaster that's just crashed, even if it's like way behind you, the other side of the park. You want to hear that thing. Totally. So our system allows us to be super sort of specific, custom to that context. But then we also have generic things that we can just reuse and just kind of you know throw in when needed. Excellent. And the, I'm guessing that the the those recipes that becomes a collaboration then with the rest of the audio team. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, it's, to, it's totally, it's kind of, it's mix driven. Yeah. You know, th that's the thing, you know, that's, that's, that's really, that's where, it, that's where it comes from. So, um, yeah, it's, I mean, at the, yeah, at the moment, these are, these are kind of implemented by programmers. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how we, we write them currently. Sure. Um, but, yeah, sure. There's, um, it's definitely, it's definitely, sort of an, it's an aesthetic decision, really. Yep. Um, yeah. Because you know, it, it's like, yeah, it's performance, but you also want it to sound good. Yeah, totally. Uh, and this sounds like exactly what you were talking about, where you're establishing those constraints up front, like this, the system that you've built and iterated um, helps you. I'm sure from the engineering side, manage the resources. Uh, while also making it clear to sound designers what tools they have at their disposal to leverage those resources towards their artistic vision of of the mix. Yeah, it's it's really it's really it's really useful actually to have a specific budget. Yeah, that is a resource that everybody can point to and say, well, we know that there are just you know there are ten crowd emitters. That's just a stated fact. Yeah, it's really handy to have that very clear. And then we can we can also make tools like this kind of um, the, the the sort of uh, um, overlay mm -hmm. um, debug overlay to actually visualize it. Yeah. That's really helpful as well. So yeah, be, being being super clear about what's going on with voice management, I think, is one of the key. Um, you know, that's one of the key strengths of our system. Yeah. So if I can add to that, mm -hmm. uh, Damien, yeah, uh, so Will and, and you talked about it, it, what it is for us, for us sound designers, is actually it's, it's the most freeing system we've ever worked with. 
because uh, even though Will says it's a code design system, so code makes up the, the rules for these recipes, what we do is we look at a scene and we say, look, I had the situation. There were a lot of dinosaurs running because they were all afraid of this big dinosaur that was fighting far back. And all I heard was footsteps. What can we do about that? And then Will goes, okay, describe the scene to me. So I've got two dinosaurs fighting. Okay, that's a recipe. If I can see two dinosaurs fighting in my viewport, they need to be prioritized over footsteps because that's much more important. Yeah. And that's how simple this works. So Will then sets that up. And, and from now on out, when I'm looking at dinosaurs fighting, footsteps will not steal the attention away. And th so that's the point I want to make. It's like, we, it is a constraint and it is something that Coder set up, but it's, it's incredibly freeing. Yeah. It, it really, really empowered us. Well, it's that collaboration again, like um, within that comes the creativity and co comes the freedom of being able to leverage that. Uh, so we're going to walk us through a little bit more of the details around this, um, this relationship. Um, so are we ready to ro roll with the slides? Um, y yeah. Do, do you want what, um, a, 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 the slide of the, the voice management system overview? Yeah. Uh, would you like? Slide, yeah. Well, let's have a quick let's have a quick look at that. I won't sort of. There's probably like an hour's worth of talking I could do on this, so I'll try and restrain myself a little bit. Well, and for folks who want to dig deeper on this, I know that there's a full live stream of a talk that you gave at the Audio Developers Conference uh, that we'll be linking to in the chat for people to, uh, you know, dive off into the deep end of of these systems after the live stream. But uh, yeah, please give us a, cool. an overview. Thank, thank you, Damien. Yeah, so this, this is just a kind of um, a schematic of the different components of the system. So yeah, sort of going back to our like overview, uh, game audio overview. So we've got the audio triggering and then it kind of flows in and we have these, um, yeah, these dynamic audio objects. So they're, they're, you know, they're a bit like, you know, a regular game object emitter. Um, but sometimes they don't post through to the sound engine. That's the key. That's the key bit of information. So we have those guys. Then we have um, what we call a virtualizer, and the virtualizer is basically in charge of physicalizing or virtualizing these dynamic audio objects. So it's really the, it's the thing that decides. Okay, you know, do you make it through to the sound engine or not? Yeah. Um, and yeah, we have basically a budget um, that flows into the virtualizer, which really says. How many how many physical emitters can you have? Is it ten? Is it a hundred? Um, and then we have a, a recipe, which we, we talked about recipes. You know, it will just be, you know, it'll be the, the nearest. Yep. It, it'll be like the nearest recipe. So if you have the nearest recipe and a budget of ten, guess what? You're going to get the nearest ten emitters. They're going to make it through to the sound engine, and that's really that's really it. That's how that's how the uh, that's how the system works. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think um, if we just um, go on to the audio objects. Yeah, let me um, ask a slide. question though first. Does the budget Not scale, sure. or is the budget fixed? So the budget, um, the budget can be uh, dynamic. Great. Yeah. So you might have different contexts in your game. You might have, um, you know, uh, you might have a, a scenario where you want to give all the budget to dinosaurs for some particular reason. Yep. Or well, then you might have a different context where you really care about vehicles. Let's say the player's driving around in their in their Jeep or something like that, and you know you want to give all the budget there. So yes, these you can flow between the two. Yep. But the system uh, it doesn't let you overspend. That's key. Perfect. So you can't. You know, it's it's a very it's a very fair uh, chancellor <laughs> distributing the budget. <sighs> His, yeah. his hand is always on the purse of our audio. Yes, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, and then do you have these recipes are additive? They're one at a time? Like, Yeah, so the, the recipes themselves, you, you'll always have one recipe per virtualizer. Okay. But you can compose recipes. So you can kind of reuse the code. You can have a visible and distance, or you can add a custom one that talks about you know, fighting lions or something very specific. Got it. And you can kind of, you can build them up. So we're always sort of, we're always reusing um, the generic things. Um, 
Yeah, and I guess just I guess one other key thing about this this whole sort of um, diagram that we're looking at is that you'll have one of one of these virtualizers per category. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if people can visualize that. You, you'll have you'll have this this kind of virtualizer for you know you have one for animals. You have one for crowd. Gotcha. You have one for vehicles. So each category's got their own virtualizer with its own budget and recipe. That's cool. sort of the core. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I can envision it. And again, it's, it has a, a simple complexity uh, where... That's what we're aiming for, yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. Great. Great. Uh, cool. So I th yeah. that's, that's, probably enough, that's probably enough looking at... That's probably enough of a deep dive. Um, okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, anything else you want to tip off here before we switch gears? I would say one other quick thing yep. that I just want to mention, which is, you know, like obviously, you know, writing all this code, all this type of stuff, it's, it's, it's you know, it, it's a luxury. In some ways, it's a luxury to be able to do this. But if you do it, you have to make sure it's reusable. Yeah. And that should really be underscored. Like, you can't just basically write some voice management, you know, slap it in your game and then go, oh, well, we actually need a different system for this other bit of the game. Like you, that's terrible. And if you can't reuse the system on this other project that you're going to do, well, certainly for us, that would never cut it. So we've really strived to make this stuff reusable and kind of make it so we can just plug it into whatever situation it needs to be used in. Brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, a couple of good questions coming in from the chat. I'll put them past you before we shift over to Matthew's side. Uh, we talked a little bit and we saw in this video, you know, the debug side, uh, when sounds are being culled from the engine uh, as part of this virtualizer, you know, uh, is this debug this, the, the main window that a designer has into understanding what's been culled? It, it, it is, it, it, it's the main, it's the main way to visualize it. Um, you know, we, we can also, there are also some, um, there are also some, some, some debug tools that show you the kind of numbers flowing up and down, that type of thing, sure. more of a sort of spreadsheet view, which is useful for certain circumstances. But this, we found that this kind of emitter overlay thing is really useful. And you can obviously do stuff like, you can kind of freeze the listener and then move the move the camera and then pause the game so you can kind of really sort of see exactly what's what's happening cool um so it's it's really it's really handy um tool that sounds super powerful uh okay this is the wild card one then uh in in the wake of the geforce ampere launch uh which promises ssd to gpu memory pipelines you got any hot takes on uh, on what the future holds for that? For audio? Well, it certainly sounds very exciting. <laughs> well, more is 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 not always better, and I think the whole story here is that we're trying to reduce what we're creating. We're creating so many sounds nowadays, and we have all this technology that lets us do thousands of sounds, and it's a cacophony. Uh, the, the important information that the player needs is lost. The important information that communicates the world is lost, and we spend so much time just trying to get the mix right. So we kind of turned that upside down, and, and Will already said that. It's like looking at linear sound design, and what can we, what, what can we learn from that? And we can learn that there's a director and a, a uh, sound designer relationship on a film and they look scene by scene what's important right now and we can't do it in real time but we do it while we play the game while we look at the game we say actually in this kind of scene this is what we should have and and that's the script that we're writing and it's still very dynamic it's still able to kind of portray the camera moving in and out at the extreme speeds player building something that is all stuck together or very wide open which is another reason we can't just trust distance because if you have everything at 100 meters apart you wouldn't hear anything it would be very boring but if everything is right around you it would be a cacophony again so yeah. these 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 
the thing that the GPU that I'm really interested in is getting access to that black box. We're doing more and more on the GPU. We're doing collision on it. We're doing uh, AI is starting to run on it. We're doing a lot of VFX. And if we in audio don't know what these things are doing, then we have no real good way of of putting any sound on it. So I'm more interested in, in the way back. How fast can the GPU tell us in audio what it's been doing? Is there is there wind going through the grass and is it moving around the player? Can I actually see the grass move and, and get that information and get this grass to sound as it goes by? That that's We have to fake all of this, usually. I mean, there's some beautiful examples out there. The Last of Us 2 does a fantastic job in, in doing these kind of things. But... Um, yeah, the more it's on the GPU, the, the more we need we need to know what it's doing. A lot of the time, what we're doing is very impressionistic, Damien. Yeah. It's, um, you know, we're summing up the feel of the environment, but we're not trying to really get get it, get scientific about it. Um, there are games that will get scientific about it. Maybe we'll do that in the future, you know, where where it really does matter exactly what that reflection is doing off that wall. And whereas what we tend to do an impressionistic approach where it doesn't matter quite, we don't need to do the numbers quite so intensely, you know. But having said that, I don't think we'd ever turn down some GPU cycles, would we, Matt? <laughs> yeah. Nope. <laughs> uh, a future where we're Absolutely simulating either. every blade of grass is, is certainly quite a ways off. Uh, synthesizing yeah. their their interaction and but and this impressionistic worldview um you're absolutely painting a, a beautiful picture for people with sound of these experiences uh at a level of detail i think that that really speaks to communication right uh, because ultimately that's one of sound's primary roles is communicating um the environments communicating the experience. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to hand it off to Matthew. Matthew, tell us about your role and then dig us in a little bit deeper on uh, the side of things that uh, that you end up living in. Let's check if I have my mic off. Yeah, I do. Um, so I'm, I'm a sound designer. I, I'm on the design side of the projects. Uh, I often get involved in the mixing of our games, which also means I often am on that, that last part that Will described earlier, where instead of making the game sound nice, you're just trying to make it work. And you're just looking at that wise profiler that tells you why are you trying to play 400 sounds? I don't like this at all. And, and you're, just, you're just going through the project and you're trying to organize it and I think over the course of uh, four of these games now that I've worked on uh, there's lessons learned and to echo what Will said as well is if you if you implement the thing you're working on on the smallest level like I'm making a spaceship so I'm putting some engines on it I'm putting some attenuation ranges it has my own compression set and it has this and that and such you've created this kind of microcosmos of a really nice sounding thing that does not scale. Because when you're coming from the other end, from the mix perspective, it's like, I have to go through all these uh, share sets and all these implementations, all these different ideas that different sound designers have about how they should implement a project. And I think that was the, the design side journey. How do we scale up the project itself, the WISE project? Great, great. Uh, and, and this is unique not only because of the kinds of games that you're making, but also the size of the teams, the transportability of the code as it goes from game to game, project to project, uh, as well as the user-generated side of things, right? Yeah. So, uh, all, yeah, and uh, yeah, you're trying to be the mixer for all of these things. You're you're in between these this this piece. Yeah, I did. If if, if the sound design is brilliant and the code is brilliant, but the mix doesn't work, then you've done all the work for nothing. It's it is the it, there's two points I feel that are essential for a project: is how you set it up, and then how you mix it, and they're they're completely related to each other. Yeah. And that's I think that's what Jim's been working on in getting the right people on the project, and it's what Will's been working on in in making sure that we only get the information we need and that we're not 
going through all this data and because uh, Will hasn't said that yet and correct me if I'm wrong Will but we can have up to 7,000 game objects uh, that have sounds on them so even more RTPCs even more sounds in, in a game world yeah 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 absolutely yeah this is, you know, we let the players place things in the world. They're going to place a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah. A lot of the same thing, usually. <laughs> yeah, lots of the same thing, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah we've... Up about a thousand meters. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'd, so you're... I'd relate it to signal to noise, right? You're, you're really trying to distill the signal to noise when you're talking about, you know, accessing the WISE project from the authoring perspective. Um, again, signal and noise, communicating to the player from the experience, the important pieces of, of what they're, uh, what's happening. Uh, yeah. So great. Yeah. It's a great story. Yeah. And uh, yeah, just like one of the things that's always fun is like you make a tree, right? And you put a sound on a tree and you say, come close to the tree, you hear a tree sound. What do our users do? They go, you know that tip of the tree that will make an excellent bush if you place nine of them like this and then copy them 50 times all over the place. That's how they make little bushes because there's one tiny bit of a much larger object. So that is a 300 sound objects right there in one spot. So it means we cannot put a sound on a single tree. It means that we have to derive from the game world what a, what a forest is. Yeah. And you get into philosophical talks about trees and forests and seeing them for this and what. And, um, and you're constantly coming up with systems that describe the world. Well, Jim said that really well. It's like, what's the impression of what I'm looking at? Not what's the literal thing that's there. Because for our games, it just doesn't scale. Right. So it's film as well. I mean, film doesn't do that. Film, film does the impressionistic thing. It's, it's, it's what underpins the emotion of the scene. Well, and the games you make are borderline um, fiction, not fiction, right? Because something like uh, Planet Zoo is a documentary, right? <laughs> the expectation is a somewhat naturalistic representation of reality, you know. Elite Dangerous aside, not reality yet, but, uh, you know, kind of on the other side of that scale, right? So you're, you're covering all of the cinematic bases. <laughs> yeah, we've done spaceships, dinosaurs, roller coasters, uh, elephants, lions, tigers. Uh, yeah. Great. Did we did two? Yeah, we did do tigers. So, so yeah, it's it's fun. <laughs> it is fun. Uh, do you want to walk us through the Wise Project a bit for Planet Z? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Great. So let's get. Let's see if we can see that here. So um, this is a an older version of the Wise Project, um, and uh, let's see. I'm checking the stream there if it's coming through. which it is, that's fantastic. So there's gonna be a bit of time delay, but um, so when we talk about this, this kind of relationship between a mix and the project, then I think one of the hardest parts that you have as a, as a lead on a project is to create it. It's like, where do I start? How do I set it up? And over the course of four games, we've come to the conclusion that there's some things that are really useful and some things that you need to organize. A little bit like what Will said when he showed how his emitters work. It's like you, you work in categories. And um, I like to, to think about uh, how can I implement something in one place in the WISE project and not everywhere throughout the WISE project. So in our project, there's a very strict kind of separation between the designer, the, the person that implements, and the mixer, the, the person that mix. And we're always thinking about where does the mix start? And ideally, the mix doesn't start until you get to the... Uh, master mixer hierarchy. And if I show you our actor mixer structure here, we start with a top level um, actor mixer. And the reason for that is um, on this level, we set defaults. We set a default for conversion settings. And that's one of those things. If you, if you look at um, 
how I implemented earlier, I would have my spaceship and it would have a separate compression setting for left engine back. And, and then everybody in the project did it and you've got a hundred compression settings. So rather than that, we have just a couple of them. We have uh, six of them, which are very low, low, and they, they just do what WISE does really well. They have their sample rate detection. They have a minimum sample rate, maximum sample rate. And if we're on a multi-platform game, I'll replicate that for other platforms. I'll do tests so that this, the bank sizes are roughly the same. And because this is set at this level, we have the mono quality. Anything in this project will have this setting unless a sound designer specifically overrides it, which if we go into a little bit lower into our animals here, then you see that the animals have a certain override. Um, they will be sending themselves to a different bus from that earlier bus. This earlier bus all goes into the game mix, top level. Animals all go to in an, in a default animal. So sound designer adds something, forgets to do something, doesn't matter. It's, it's set at the highest level. And when you're working with a bunch of people on your team, establishing these kind of standards means that people can feel safe not having to check yeah. every box, not having to do everything because they can rely on, again, I'll say constraints, but they, they can rely on the, <sighs> the standards of the system that have been established, right? Yeah, it's a safety net yeah. and, and it's always there. Yeah, and um, the, the, t it, it takes some time to do this before you do your project and it also takes a bit of experience we've done this three four times now so we've we've kind of see where the where the pain points of our projects are so to speak so this this has evolved over time but we always try to do the minimum viable for a project we say what does it need and then you go you go completely crazy right you go creative it needs this and this and this and this but what does it really only need to work and you implement that first yeah. and when you do that it's very easy to add on top of it which is how this project works as well and it's how recipes work and 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 is how jim set up the company actually works well company the the, <laughs> the audio team can't uh, um so Taking that, for instance, with the animals, one of the things I always found is that if you have a lot of individual sounds, and our animals have a lot of individual sounds. If I open the elephant here, there is a lot yeah, of- Just talk me through like, some of those things. Like, Yeah, we we, we have like, um, I'll explain this audibility thing in, in a second, right. but we have um, levels of, of detail based on how close the camera is. So we have our, our really, our close, close-up sounds. This is all the intimate stuff that we hear because animals in a zoo, they're very quiet. They don't make a lot of noise. Um, so we we kind of exaggerated their footsteps, their, their kind of skin, they're moving around. All those sounds are very intimate sounds and they're, they're close sounds. So they're all grouped together as close sounds here. Uh, and then we have uh, we have far, we have hero sounds, and we have near sounds. The near sounds is the bulk of of an of an elephant sound in this case, and the hero sounds are sounds you would always want to hear. So there's definitely a recipe that looks for hero sounds and tries to prioritize them. So if an elephant does a loud roar because it's just been given some food, you want to hear that, and you want to slowly hear your park get more and more populated with the animals that you put in there. Um, you can see that we put little LUFS uh, next to each of these uh, audibilities. What I don't want to do is mix every individual sound when, when it comes to the game mix. So we've got like a target here. And uh, what works really well is, is setting up a target like this. And now what I ask uh, designers to do, I ask them is uh, go to your sound and just start pressing that play button and turn capture on on your loudness meter and just start playing as many of these as you can, which for some reason it isn't doing because it's a live test and I tested all of this earlier and then yeah, it was it's working. Okay, it's okay. What am I yeah, what am I forgetting to do here? Anyways, you'll get your you'll get your readout on the right here saying that it hits about twenty th minus twenty-three. And that way they can test their own sounds within this structure and see if they're uh, if they're working the way they should be working, Perfect. this bugs me. I'm gonna now. I don't. I want to now live debug while this is not working on the air. Um, uh, anyways, so that's no. We're not gonna do that. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> so we've we've got this. It's kind of pre-mixed, 
And uh, in this in this setup, these sounds go immediately to a a appropriate bus in the bus structure. There is uh, very little done else to these sounds. If you can see, there's no positioning. If we go back to the top level, there's no listener relative routing. We don't do any positioning here. This is that clickbait headline. There's no attenuation share set in this in this on this level. But if we uh, take one of these sounds and go look at our mix structure, then we come into our master mixer at a level which is called DFX animals on land. So we could combine all the animals into one master, uh, into one parent mixer. And for all of these things you just saw, we have the uh, the close-up sounds, we have the far sounds, we have a special exception for footsteps. And because it comes in here, I can go and say, I want to mix all the close sounds in the project in a slightly different way. Uh, gives me a lot of control over it. I don't have to care about what the sound designer done. They've done their implementation work. And I can mix on this level. That al already makes my job a lot easier. And the other thing that is uh, really interesting is that on this level, we start doing game-wide mix things. Um, here we have a height below water surface, which is one of the RTPCs we have that we get from uh, the camera. Is the camera on the water or over water, that sort of thing. And if we travel ourselves throughout this project, you see there's kind of, again, there is there is the opposite of what we did in the in the actor mixer structure on the master mixer structure, the sound comes in on a level, it travels upwards, and more and more things are applied to it that are game-wide. We've got our RTPCs, we got our effects, we got our states. On this level, uh, we'll probably have a few states to do with a certain way of looking at the game where we say this needs to be louder and quieter. And the higher we go up, the more broad our implementation or uh, for the mix is. So on this level, SFX, we have a slider volume SFX because people need that in the menu to turn the SFX down. Now this is the interesting bit, and that's our distance model. Um, on Jurassic World Evolution, or actually on Planet Coaster, every sound designer was creating their own attenuation share sets, which resulted in over 600 attenuation share sets, which was fine because every sound designer had a lot of control over it, but distance and an attenuation at the share set is basically mix. It's a way to control how the game sounds. And to do that where a sound is triggered is, is a bit strange, especially when our game world got so full that I wanted more space for sounds to have its own little bubble. And I figured I can do that by having a steeper fall off. And then I was confronted with 600 attenuation ranges, all with their own implementation. And, and they all needed to be recreated for the game. So we said on Jurassic World, now actually like what we have here with the generic setups, we have generic distances. We have four meters, eight meters, 16 meters, 32 meters, and they all have one curve, but it's it's cut off at the range of that attenuation share set. Is that, can you follow that? Is that, uh, I'm going very fast, I realize. <laughs> This is obviously something you know intimately and have spent a lot of time, as you mentioned, iterating across games to this point, uh, falling in the trap of 600 attenuations. Uh, and the result of that is this bus level management of fall off using uh, output bus volume in order to get that same um that same effect exactly it's if you take this this mass of implementations and all these kind of different and you kind of say can i do this in one step rather than in multiple steps what's the minimum amount of steps i can take and going through the project and saying there's a default setting is the minimum amount of steps you can take and going up through your master mixer structure and saying this here where we now arrived this is the point where we say here's our distance model, is doing it in one step rather than doing it on the attenuation level. So 
Indeed, we have a distance to listener here, and distance to listener is a curve that goes all the way up to 1024. It applies to everything to, throughout, through every sound that comes in, and this is the absolute beauty of WISE. You can make it work in a way that works for your project. So on this very level is where we start taking listener relative routing. Mm -hmm. And what that does is it basically, up until this level, each sound is its own object. It goes through the entire mixer structure as an object and the bus is kind of placed on the sounds. And that means that I can apply RTPCs, effects and, and whatnot on the sound as an individual object. And that's brilliant because it means I can have a uh, EQ driven distance model, which I have on this level. Um, and it's 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 a shelves rather than than having kind of um, having low and high pass here. And it also means that if a designer comes along, and, and they do come along quite a lot, and they made a sound, and it's like, oh, the sound is a little bit too bassy. What do they do? They'll, they'll go to the sounds, and I, I'm guilty of this as well. And they'll go to high pass and say, you know what? This sounds so much better, which is fantastic, right? It's, it's sound design, it's implementation. But if your distance model on the attenuation range also uses high pass, it basically means that I've now pushed my sound further away from the camera because the combined value from my attenuation range and my high pass filter here uh, does something to the sound that is both artistic and distance model. And I really wanted to separate those two. So effects are the way to go. If you do it on the actor mixer structure, it means you have to override the parent. So you're, you're filling in your, your uh, your EQ, EQ everywhere. And that's why I started experimenting. It's like, can we actually make WISE do something that is maybe a little bit different? And we can do it because of Will. If, if Will isn't making those 7,000 sounds into 60, 70, Will, 80 sounds. Will and a team of audio programmers. Come on. Of course. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Absolutely. And the same on, on the design side. This is, this is a team effort. Thank you, Will. <laughs> uh, I need a drink, probably. Um, if, it's, if we, it's, worth, um, it's worth mentioning, I think, worth reiterating that um, the reason why why we're doing this is is you know it when it comes to the mixing stage, if you've got six hundred attenuation sets, it's an absolute nightmare, and this this makes mixing so much easier. Oh, yeah. it's, just wonderful and quick isn't it Matt? it is you know i'm i'm talking so fast i'm still with this 10 minute thing in my head it's like i need to squash all of this into 10 minutes we're just rolling it is because three cameras <laughs> what, what, what i wanted to say was it's worth mentioning that because because our games have a free camera because we can move it around all over the place this is where this is the, the beauty of this system because it's sort of systemic. It's one model that you're applying across across the whole of Wise. Yeah, and like you said, it it does it does change the methodology that uh, comes out of the box by default in Wise uh, by changing the way that you model attenuation. It required that engine side integration, um, and so there's there's absolutely that. yeah and. I think we, as we've heard throughout this live stream, you know, the reason for this is because of the kind of game and the affordance that a player has uh, to create and to move around the game world, uh, presenting that seamlessly, the scale of that, uh, as well as the scale of people contributing to the project. You have, like you said, uh, as a sound designer integrating in the actor mixer hierarchy, you know what your expectations are for implementation. Uh, you can design for that. You can implement for that. And you can rest assured that at the end, when Matthew has his hands on the faders, uh, that, <laughs> that he will do right for, for the system of presentation and that dynamic piece of things, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's putting all the places 
it's putting everything in place beforehand and knowing where everything is. I, I never have to worry that there is something happening in the actor mixer structure that makes it more difficult to do something. If there's always a curveball at the end of the projects, like we have a vehicle now and we would like to have an interior sound design for the vehicle and we still want all the exterior sounds in the game world to come through, but they need to be muffled now. That means that a bit with this structure, we can create another bus over the normal sounds and say the normal sounds now get muffled because we have all of that in a structure. Um, and the uh, the interior get its, gets its own bus. Uh, and what's important to, to achieve that, if you want to start working with effects and, and kind of the nicer things that WISE has to offer, is that you, you don't, in this structure that we have here, start putting like um, a reverb effects or environmental effects or anything on that, you treat that again as something that you implement in one case, in one place. So we have a post-processing bus, which again has this kind of setup from the top going down where states and RTPC say on the top level, this is how you behave in a normal situation and everything below that behaves in, in a situation appropriate to it. Um, so, on the on the uh, where we tick listener relative routing above that we send everything to the appropriate environmental effects so we got two for those because the nice thing about effects on the on the bus structure is that we or in this case sense is that we can just stack them up so that's why we have two of these the first one has four cents uh, for effects the second one has some different effects that we're using and because we're using a scent on this level i can I can say this is happen. This happens when we go on the water, and at the same time, the other things happen to all the other buses, which results in a, a in a funky little RTPC labyrinth, which is a little bit complex, but it's in one place, so it's it's entirely maintainable. Um, and and the same for a distance model. This is our distance model. This is how that works. And if we go back to the elephant and we look at uh, like the close-up sounds, you can imagine you don't really want to hear uh, like an elephant tail um, in this in this setup at a thousand twenty-four meters. That's just a bit ridiculous. Even if Will has done his job right and and has made sure that we don't get a hundred elephant tails, that's still a little bit strange. So we need a, a separate system on top of that that um, that manages. A kind of performance and mix at the same time. So we, we also fade out sounds, which is a second thing that we have. It's, it's basically, this, this is a curve that fades out a sound when we no longer need it. And on Will's side, on the emitter side, we've added what you would normally add in an attenuation share set, which is the distance. So Will knows exactly what emitters, what distance they have and can take care of it. He can look at an animal and say, yeah, okay, there's an animal, it has 12 emitters, but at this range, I'm only interested in these four emitters. So there's already kind of a really nice way of filtering out stuff we don't need. And to prevent on this global distance that we have, that a sound we just cut off because yeah, it still has volume at all these ranges. We we have this secondary fade out thing that fades it out as we reach the limit of an of an emitter's distance. We even have a screenshot for that, I think, uh, okay. called distance zero one emitter ranges. Yes, let me cue that. Uh, and so Will is, and the game is puppeteering that um, that amplitude for, based on distance using the the recipes using the uh the different distances in the game to the listener so yeah i'm looking for because the listener relative routing one does that sound right uh let's see it's called distance zero one emitter ranges yep here it comes cued yeah, so this is a look into the uh, uh, into Resonator, the engine that we use to uh, to interface between code and uh, resources and and wise. And on this, you can see that we've got emitters defined, and and it corresponds with what you saw earlier. You saw the the elephant close up. Um, you and. Yeah, it's on my screen now as well. So here we basically define the emitter. So maybe Will can say something about this because this kind of crosses back into code. Cool. I'm afraid I can't see the uh, the screw the slide. Okay. Well, it's it's basically showing our uh, emitter audibility ranges. So the the spec for that, where we 
Yeah, so this this is kind of um, yeah. We we basically calculate this at runtime for all the emitters. It's actually a separate system to the voice management um, system. However, we can plug it into the voice management system and get us to do recipes based on audibility ranges, just to add some extra layers of fun there. Um, but yeah, basically, we yeah, this is just a thing. We just calculate this for every emitter in in the world based on this resource. Yep, and then using that value that you're deriving to to uh, update the RTPC and and make it audible or not, essentially. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, so we post the RTPC, but we we also kind of have recipes that go actually if that RTPC is zero we'll just call the emitter. So that's kind of where both worlds combine code side. Yeah, so then calling that emitter to make sure that uh, that it's not taking resources. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. And we, we often get, the, the, so why would you want to do this? Why would you go to all this trouble of saying, we've got these great systems in WISE that can do these things out of the box. Why would you want to, want to kind of break that apart and do it this way. And, and for us, it really was, we want to use an EQ rather than low pass and high pass uh, to, to convey distance. Um, and we want to have that implemented in one place, not all these different attenuation ranges. And it's the combination of these wishes that for us, this was the best way of implementing it. And uh, again, shows how versatile WISE is in, in allowing you to to design a project that fits really well with your game worlds and with your way of working. Yeah, and I think we just circled back and answered a question about um, you know, EQ that you had mentioned earlier from the chat. So I hope that answers the question that uh, that was posed there. But you're you're really using that EQ for distance at that higher level so that you have that more global scoped perspective of it. Yeah, and and it's also because EQs they can they can rest on top of each other, whereas low pass and high pass they're additive. So you've got a low pass value that that is corresponding to an EQ value. Let's say we take fifty as a low pass value, it goes exactly in the middle of our frequency spectrum and say, I will pass everything below where we are in the frequency spectrum right now. If you start adding low pass throughout your project, it additively low passes your sound more and more. Whereas if I have four EQs stacked on top of each other, all with a low pass at 50, I will still hear everything below below that value. And that's, that's I think, the key difference. It allows us to make one global um, distance system, distance approach, that, that rang the bell for them, absolutely. And I think, you know, back to that question of why, uh, you know, every game has its questions that it needs to answer. And and it's, to me... <laughs> yeah, that's a good way of putting to it. To me, it's less about the why, uh, although this, you know, this entire presentation answers that question, I think. Uh, but to me, the more fascinating piece is that um, that Wise allows for that flexibility. Like, hey, you want to take and and pull this piece out and and do something different? Uh, the flexibility is there, and so I think I think it's the the goal or the uh, it's it's up to us to ask that question. Why? And if we have a good enough answer for it, like. We should just be able to answer that and to hear that you've been able to answer that question for yourself within what WISE provides with the help of the programming team. Uh, again, I think that that is, that's the win. That's the win. So Yeah, yeah. We, we don't spend any time optimizing towards the end of the project. We just spend all our time mixing. I mean, of course, that's not a completely black and white statement, yeah. but it's it's mostly true. It's I can spend with uh, our team can spend most of their time at the end of the project in a mixing booth, playing the game, playing all these different ways of observing the game. Uh, I, we also have a really cool example of this implementation in a video that, uh, that I've added, Great. Um, which um, is the one that's called uh, Planet Zoo Mix Mixing Turn Off Distance. That's a great name right there. Um, and 
I can explain what's going on there if we if but of course there's a this slightly time to so I'll explain it beforehand so people can just listen to it. Um, could you bring up the Wise project again, yeah. Damien? Yeah. Yeah. So because we have distance all in one place, you can do a really cool thing. And let's have the game running and press control X. And this removes distance from the entire game. At this point in time, I can hear any emitter that's active in the game. And what's really nice about it, and you'll see that in the video as well, is it reveals so many problems in your game that you would only hear if the camera is close enough to it. And, and because we have these games where you can move the camera around so much, one of our problems was like uh, something happens sometimes, but uh, it's really hard to replicate. Whereas if you remove your distance model, you just park the camera somewhere and start listening. And at the end of the video, I've put some little text in that shows you some of the problems we had at a point in development. Uh, and that's that's a really cool little bonus feature of this implementation that we, we weren't looking for it but it just came as a as a happy accident cool so i'm going to roll that video And there go the curves. That is such a cool trick. Uh, so fantastic. Let's see, are we still rolling yeah. a little bit? Here comes the train. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, what a great thing to have at your disposal to be able to to undo the an, uh, the attenuations that you've built, hear the entire world at once. Uh, it's a perspective that uh, that must uh, must give you some a lot of insight into what's happening. Oh, yeah. 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 You did. It's, you can even almost mix the game at that level. If you're hearing like um, you heard the bang of the door that, that closed, that was way too loud, but you would only hear it if your camera was close to the door and there was somebody going actually into that door to feed an animal and, and the door smashed close. And it's in, in these kind of games, it's one of the, the real challenges is mixing the game from the player's perspective, from all these different camera angles. Uh, and this helped us yeah, it really helps. Yeah, with consistency, right? Because from that uh, from that zoomed back zero attenuations perspective, like you said, you have the full presentation of what's being delivered from the actor mixer uh, without the influence of distance uh, affecting anything, and you can have that um, that audibility into the balance across those different categories. Yeah, and it only took four games to get there. <laughs> well, I can't wait to hear where it goes next. Uh, you know, we are always evolving in game audio. Uh, we are always pushing those next steps, whether it's that GPU communication we were talking about earlier, uh, future versions of WISE and, uh, and new cool things in the toolbox for people to leverage. Uh, I think we'll always be pushing forward towards those futures. So excellent, excellent. <laughs> uh, so that seems like uh, a good place to land with the presentation of 
uh, dynamic mixing at scale. That's quite a system. Yeah. And again, I'm I'm super grateful for uh, bringing this kind of uh, you know perspective to folks out there using Wise. Again, taking and extending on the functionality that already exists, uh, building out your own workflows that suit your game. Uh, these are all core things that we uh, we believe empower audio professionals to make these choices about interactivity. And so it's it's super cool to uh, to get that perspective. Uh, I'm wondering if we can circle back a bit. And we lost Crofty, but uh, He's I, guarantee back. He'll, <laughs> I guarantee he can jump right in with this. Uh, I had a dog, a dog barking incident. So that's, ah, yeah. <laughs> you were just demonstrating audibility there, Jim. Isn't that <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On my distance model. Yeah. Nice. Uh, but so let's circle back to this last piece of scale. And I'm, if, if any folks out there uh, in the community, in the chat, have questions, now's the time. Uh, queue it up, and we'll try to get those answered for you. Um, but let's, let's talk about scale from an audio team perspective. Uh, give me an idea of some of the roles. You touched on it a bit. And I know that in, in game audio, we have a kind of, um, yeah, we've adopted several roles over the time. Uh, but you were talking about some new ones. So can you give us a sketch of the spectrum of audio roles that, you're, that you've hired for? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so. Obviously, we've got, we've got various levels of sound designer uh, from graduate up to principal. Um, and then, you know, we've got some, as I, as I touched on earlier, we've got some su support staff who, um, you know, maybe are more interested in implementation than um, than design per se, uh, who who are, you know, also interested in, in how WISE works and how, how to optimize way um, and you know are interested in finding out more about that and uh, we're very happy about that too um, so they're specialists who can come in we've called them audio riggers just because of the parallel with with the art team it feels like a good parallel um, and and on the parallel for folks who don't know what a rigger does uh, over on the art side of things so it's just basically setting up um, I mean, I'm not I'm not an expert myself, but but set, setting up um, models to be animated, technically. Yeah. Uh, so you have you have you have an animator, you have an artist, but you need someone in the middle, who who brings those two together. Um, I've heard the and, title um, technical artist. We've we've yeah. thrown yeah. around yeah, the, the title technical I mean, sound designer in the world a bit. Yeah, absolutely. Well, for us, technical sound designer will be someone. I mean, maybe in other companies, a technical sound designer would be what we call a rigger. In our company, I think a technical sound designer has been defined by originally a coder crossing over into into asset creation. So, so it's somebody who was a stride who basically self-iterated. It was a wonderful, it was a wonderful. <laughs> person. He's become self-employed now, uh, and and he's make, working on his own game. And we're hoping he'll come back to us, but. Um, Hi, Steve. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, for us, a technical sound designer was somebody who 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 could write code in C C plus um, plus, and but also create assets and and implement them uh, music wise or or, um, or or sound design wise. Um, and then we've got we've got um, uh, build engineers now, and we've got an audio test engineer, I should say. Yeah, uh, isn't that right? You can probably talk about that. Uh, well, yeah, just, just writing uh, writing automated tests. Uh, basically, we don't want um, to do uh, manual QA, although there's a place for that, of course. As much of that wants to be automated as possible. So yeah, we have um, we have we have um, some some people on the team doing that role, which is just very useful. Uh, just and just, yeah, just some integrate integrating that continuous integration suites and all that type of thing. Um, and look, one, one, fit, one fun thing that the audio riggers do as well is uh, creating stuff um, that we'll use WAPI to kind of inject into the WISE project. So basically, when we've got some structure that we think, yeah, this is how 
this is how we want this to be implemented, they can kind of you basically inject it into into the project, and that's something we're we're sort of um, ramping up on at the moment. So Wappy being yeah. the wise authoring API, and and these are just workflow speed ups to bridge the gap between either content and the wise project, or kind of shaping the wise content in such a way that that fits your your systemic approach. Yeah, it's helping us. It's helping us scale like all of these things. You know, if we can basically Great. inject that into the project in a known way, I'd much rather that than somebody sort of hand click something in. It's just I'd I'd prefer them make it sound good. You know. Yeah. One really good example of that is that they've built this little emailer that emails you if you put a sound in that is looping and doesn't have a stop event, you get a nice little email saying what are you doing, and <laughs> and. Uh, and it's it's brilliant. We no longer have these sounds that just escape and self-replicate and multiply, uh, because the email catches them. It's a very it, it's it's brilliant to have that kind of backup. That is a a great implementation of a Wappy script uh, that, yeah, absolutely closes the loop. On that. <laughs> uh, okay, so good questions coming in from uh, the chat. Uh, how did you manage which sound events are tagged as different emitter classes? Uh, is that defined in engine, implied by the work unit names, something else? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question, like that. Um, <laughs> at the moment, it's quite sort of prescribed. Like, there aren't that many categories, and we basically, we, we, we kind of, yeah, we set it up so when you're adding say an animal, we just know that's going to be an animal category. It's quite fixed in that way. Sure, great. Um, yeah. But there's there's a really cool thing there as well, is that they asked if we do it in the WISE project. You could actually go into the WISE project where you now have the ignore parent option on um, on your performance tab, where you basically say, oh, I've got animals, and I set it to five sounds maximum. And then everything underneath that ignores the parent and is its own cluster of sounds again. So that top level would choose five sounds from that structure. And if you work out all your priorities right, you could kind of approach what we're doing. It's not quite like what's the fastest moving object on screen, but you can restrict with the correct structure how many sounds show up in your in your game. So there's, there's functionality in WISE that lets you replicate some of it. Yeah, but again, it's that scale that you've enabled through extending uh, these systems outside of WISE. Yeah, cool. And and it becomes flexible, and that's that's the really the real beauty of that. Yeah. Uh, okay. Do you, did you have a period of transitioning from transition traditional implementation over to the new method? Was that the leap between projects? Yeah, that took four projects, didn't it, Will? Because we started with just a crowd on Planet Coaster, and that was our first kind of let's do an impression rather than a one-to-one -one sound on every object. Um, and then Will basically took that and, and with his team well, supercharged it. Yeah, with, <laughs> it supercharged it. Really, like, took a really simple idea and made it into something that I think could work on any type of game. In fact, we're using it on very different genres of games at Frontier. Yeah, and of course, because all of our games are live, we can transition technology back to projects that were started, you know, previously. So obviously, you know, it's, again, that's a sort of evolution. We don't just kind of rewrite part of, um, the game that was released a few years ago, but we can we can take these lessons and kind of plug them back into the games. Um, and yeah, stuff like um, yeah, Jurassic World Evolution on Switch, we were able to take a game that was released released several years ago, plug some of this learning back into um, this game for a new platform, which was you know um, we we had to cut the voice count there as well, and basically. Um, yeah, it, it kind of allowed us to to, to to get to that point. Yeah, so you can... But, yeah, but it still sounds great. <laughs> yeah, cutting the voice count you know, in, a, in a properly contextual way. So you don't notice that at all. Yeah, you know? that was the thing. It, 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 it sounds 
basically identical. Like mm. it's 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 a really uh, it's it was uh, yeah the guys did a really great job uh, with that and our, our audio riggers particularly helped out with that as well. Yeah, because essentially you took uh, you know the evolution of the system, which optimizes the number of voices, uh, brought that to the switch port, and and that allowed for you know essentially business as usual even on the limited platform because you had applied that kind of update. Yeah, which is crazy because this was basically, you know, it was a PC and console game. Now people are walking around with it in their, in their pocket, you know. <laughs> it's pretty cool, pretty cool. Okay, so the last one, and this might be a little more inspirational uh, outro, but uh, the question is, do you use or plan to use procedural sound? And, and maybe, maybe a definition of procedural sound up front would be a good idea because. Yeah, that's always, that's, I mean, in, in a certain sense, this, the crowds are procedural because there's not a, a single person in the crowd that has an emitter on it that reacts to their presence around other people and creates an ever larger crowd. We, we, we get data and the data is applied to a set of, of loops and individual sounds and that's procedurally generated but i assume they mean do you create sound from nothing do you use uh, synth one or or just noise or something like that yeah i think procedural synthesis tends to be that uh the specificity that people are looking for when they're dreaming of the future right uh, yeah and this may be yeah. ties in a bit with a question from uh earlier on where someone was asking, wow, how do you record all of these sounds, right? So with procedural synthesis being an opportunity to, well, yeah, avoid going out into the field with a microphone, potentially, uh, versus the, it, the detail of, uh, of going out and actually capturing sounds in the wild. Yeah, I mean, it's the, it's the crazy dream of the future, isn't it? But it's... It's yeah. I mean, it's it's a uh, it, it's something that that is always it's a little bit like it's a little bit like procedural music. It's always a great intellectual pursuit, but actually, in practice, it's quite disappointing. <laughs> um, in my experience, but I think this is maybe where we can use some of those GPU cycles. <laughs> Yeah, you know that that is that is the kind of area where that we could really, really that that's what's exciting about the future and getting more power is where you you can start doing that kind of you know imagine having interactive water that you could model, you know I mean that would be fantastic. And we've seen that yeah. we've seen that academically for years, right? Yeah. Uh, fluid simulations yeah. that have a synthesis component, fabric, um, you know, pottery and all that kind of stuff yeah yeah and Absolutely. yeah i mean i think the fact the fact that we're we're sort of not that enthusiastic about procedural sounds as they are now is a fantastic challenge to somebody who thinks they've got an idea on how to do next generation procedural sound you know and, current, and that's the current thing that is there you know isn't isn't good enough so it's a great opportunity but it's it's this problem is a problem that we are approaching from the edges and there's some of the some of the things that wise does like uh, generating wind interactively where it's just taking these noise tones and it knows what frequencies wind have and you have this beautiful interactive control over it you can just you can just go into the individual leaves and as jim said you could do water now water doesn't quite work yet uh, it's it's weird because you only need to compress this stream and we've got water, but it's very hard to do it in in a in a in a good sounding way and it's interactive. But wind, we we're there. Wind can be done really well. You can use you can use the engine in in Wise and just add one layer of recorded on top of it to make it real. A good impulse. Oh man, you, you can get a lot of steam. Anything that's noise, basically, we can do. I think we're there, but it's it's and it's dynamic. It's, yeah. And it's full fidelity. Uh, you don't have to compress it. Uh, there's just there's a ton there, of course, to unpack. But you're absolutely right. Yeah, but I mean, where it's subtra subtracted. So if you're starting with kind of a pink noise, 
been potential there, isn't there? Totally. If, if, if you're sculpt, basically just sculpting, sculpting noise, uh, you know, with with data from the game, then it's very exciting. But no, I was gonna, I was gonna say, what? Yeah, is is sound seed water in the pipeline? <laughs> I, I haven't heard of it yet. So, uh, <laughs> a crazy dream of mine. I'm not saying, but wow, that does sound cool. Uh, and again, I think yeah. that that approaching it from the edges, right? What problem does procedural synthesis solve? That's fundamentally the question, right? Something like sound seed grain, hey, it's there, you know. Uh, but solve the problem with it, you know, or tell us what problem needs to be solved uh, because like you said there there exists these tools within the toolbox of wise to do these things and it's just a question of you know what's the problem that people need to solve back to this idea of scale you know games that unfold over years over countless maps over constant constant expansions you know these are games that may be more and more difficult to paint every corner with audio. So how do we leverage procedural and synthesis techniques to to optimize that, right? Uh, oh, absolutely. I mean, we, I mean, we've been looking at that with with, with voices, you know, in, in Elite, for example. It's something we've explored uh, and, and we're, you know, we're talking to people about, we're talking to people who are right at the cutting edge of this stuff. And it's it's tantalizing or just out of reach yeah you know <laughs> but, it, but that's what the future holds and it's very exciting yeah. you know because we've been starved of resources really at runtime yeah yeah yes eight ray casts per, per frame eight <laughs> visuals have a million can we just get a few just, yeah. just a few ray casts please uh okay well i'll i think leaving it on this like Dream of the future is a perfect place to land today's live stream with you. Again, thanks Frontier for uh, unpacking this system, uh, showing us the world and letting us listen to the world through your ears and through your project uh, and through the great work that you've done. Um, it's been a joy for me. Uh, Thanks to folks who joined along. Uh, it was great to have your engagement and interact with you. I uh, hope we were able to bring some answers to your questions, along with just some inspiration to fuel your uh, game developments and your game audio in the future. Uh, thanks again to my guests. And there we go. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much. Signing off. Thank you. See you on the next Wise Up On Air.